Hello everyone, it's Dr Paul Rose and in this video I'm on a virtual safari. We're going to be visiting two East African national parks to look at the wildlife that lives there and to investigate the behaviours of the animals in a little bit more detail. Our first stop is Arusha National Park in northeastern Tanzania. Arusha National Park was established in 1960 and named after the capital of Tanzania. It's only 25 kilometers from the city center. Arusha National Park is a small national park. It's around 53 square miles or 137 square kilometers in area. Consequently, it doesn't give the huge game drive type experience that people might associate with the other famous national parks in East Africa, like the Serengeti. But the range of habitats within the national park, savannas, grasslands, woodlands and wetlands, provide a wealth of wildlife watching and the national park is home to a diverse array of species. Arusha National Park covers Mount Meru, a volcano with an elevation of around about 4,500 metres. The dense forests of the volcano provide perfect habitat for primates and the park has healthy populations of the blue monkey and the black and white colobus monkey too. You can probably hear the clicking of cameras at the start of this video. Eastern black and white colobus monkeys cope relatively well with human disturbance. They can be found in primary and secondary forests as well as logged forests too. Eastern black and white colobus, like all colobus, are kind of a ruminant in terms of their digestive processes, eating leaves and the foliage from trees. The eastern black and white colobus is preyed upon by leopards and consequently that's their main predator in Arusha National Park. Adult colobus are black and white and youngsters are pure white when they're born. They are sociable animals and they live in family groups. They prefer to forage high in the treetops to evade danger. Whilst you're scanning the branches for the colobus, be sure to look out for other species too, like this Vonderdecken's hornbill. This is a small hornbill that's found in open woodlands. The Vonderdecken's hornbill is sexually dimorphic. This is a male. He has this beautiful red and yellow bill. The female Vonderdecken's hornbill has an all black bill. Hornbills have a strong pair bond and both sexes are involved in caring for their youngsters. Because of the high plant-based nature of the colobus monkey's diet, they spend a lot of time resting, which they need to do to digest this fibrous plant material. As I said earlier, colobus are almost like ruminants. They have a saculated stomach where microbial fermentation occurs, which helps break down the cellulose in the plant leaves, which means the monkeys can get energy from their food. But even though they are high in the trees, they have to keep a watch when they're sat around digesting their dinner. Leopards are one of the key predators of the colobus monkeys. And in Arusha National Park, the leopard is the top predator. Leopards are excellent climbers and they can take primates both at the tops of trees as well as antelopes and gazelle from the grasslands themselves. So many species like the colobus, the hornbill, and like this olive baboon, will give particular calls that will explain to the neighbourhood around them that a leopard is on the prowl and everybody should watch out. And these particular calls that relate to these different types of predators direct the anti-predatory responses, the flight behaviour of the prey species to get them out of danger. Whilst olive baboons are good at climbing, they spend a lot of time foraging on the ground and they're one of the more terrestrial of the primates. 
baboons have a strict social order and a fission fusion society. Dominant males are much larger than females, and females carry their youngsters around on their backs. Fission fusion means that the dominant male and his harem of females will go away as a smaller subgroup to feed and forage during the day. In the evening, all of these little subgroups will come back together to form one larger overall group of baboons. And this provides extra protection from the baboon's top predator, which is the leopard. You can hear the sounds of wildlife all around you whilst you're experiencing your safari tents. And the remoteness of where these safari tents are set up means you don't always just hear the wildlife. Sometimes you get to see it in camp too, such as these in parlour that are merrily wandering past the tents. Arusha National Park contains some alkaline soda lakes and these are a real draw for a whole range of wildlife species. You can probably see the pink dots around the edge of this lake. And these are some of the park's most famous inhabitants. And in fact, these particular species are a real draw across the East African national parks that contain these alkaline lakes. The pink dots are lesser flamingos, the smallest species of flamingo. Many millions of them flock to these East African soda lakes to forage and breed. The lesser flamingo is a near threatened species because so many individuals rely on such a handful of habitats. This puts them under pressure from any changes to the habitats. They might not be able to find other suitable places to live. The wetlands as a source of permanent water and the rich volcanic soil allow grasses and other vegetations to grow abundantly. And this vegetation can support some of the largest species on the African continent, such as this mega herbivore, the giraffe. Giraffe are a browsing species, and you can see the browse line in this acacia tree, where the tree has been able to grow above the height of the hungry mouths of the giraffes. When scanning through the woodlands, you might see some species that are migratory and at some times of the year can be found in Europe, like these European bee eaters. For those of you that have gone on holiday to France, Spain, Portugal or the Mediterranean regions, you might be familiar with this beautifully coloured bird. The European bee eater breeds in Europe and then winters here in Africa. This migratory strategy means it can breed in Europe with reduced competition for food and nesting sites because if it remained in Africa it would be competing for breeding sites and for feeding sites with the resident African bee eater species. And looking closely into the densest trees you might find a nocturnal species that's roosting during the daytime. This is a milky eagle owl, one of the largest species of eagle owls and it has these beautiful bright pink eyelids. Milky eagle owls are perfectly capable of carrying away prey the size of a small primate. They rest up during the daytime, camouflaged against the network of branches, ready to come out and hunt of a night time. Milky eagle owls are territorial and have large home ranges, so they're not that common a species to find, but they really are worth a closer look when you do spot one, because of their sheer size and power, the range of species that they can catch as prey, and therefore they give an indication of the health of that ecosystem. And here's another forest dwelling specialist. This is a red diker, one of the 22 species of small forest dwelling antelopes. Dikers are incredibly shy and hard to spot. And in fact, the name diker comes from the Dutch word meaning to dive, a clue to the animal's predatory escape responses by running and diving into cover. Dikers are commonly found by themselves, in pairs or in small family groups. 
Here's a species of ungulate with an exact opposite social strategy to the diker. These are Cape buffalo, a grassland specialist. Cape buffalo will be found out in the open in large herds. They have a very democratic social system where the oldest and most experienced females in the herd will vote each day on the direction that the herd takes to travel and feed in. The grasslands around these soda lakes within Arusha National Park are home to many wetland species that make use of the lake itself and the surrounding woodlands. It might seem unusual to spot a duck in a tree, but this is a comb duck, a male bird because of the large bump on top of his bill. Comb ducks can occur in large flocks and outside of the breeding season they can separate into groups of only male and only female to reduce territoriality and competition. But they also really like perching in trees. Comb ducks are one of the largest species of duck and again are sexually dimorphic because the female lacks the large bump on the male's bill. In fact, an alternative name for the comb duck is the knob-billed goose. Other specialists of wetland areas are these waterbuck, a large ungulate in the antelope family. Waterbuck have a very greasy coat, which gets greasier when they are sexually excited during the breeding season. The smell of this grease on their coat is so repellent that it can drive away predators and it's thought that this odour or musk that they produce is another form of defence that the waterbuck uses to evade predation. If they are attacked by a predator, waterbuck will often run and jump into nearby wetlands, hence their name. Don't always look out for the mammals and birds when you're on safari. Think of the other creatures that might be around too. This is a leopard tortoise, and the leopard tortoise is the fourth largest species of tortoise in the world. An adult can weigh up to 13 kilograms. They're widely distributed across Africa, but their camouflage pattern can make them hard to spot. The leopard tortoise is a grazing species and prefers short grass plains to collect its food. The short grass plains of the East African national parks are some of their most famous features, benefiting everyone from the tortoise to the giraffe. Within the short grass plains, we find acacia trees, shrubs and thickets, which provide alternative foraging opportunities. And in this photograph, even within a species, you can see different evolutionary adaptations to foraging. The male giraffe, at the foreground of this picture is much taller than the females. He can feed at full stretch on leaves the females can't access. The different sexes will segregate in their feeding and foraging behaviours to reduce competition and therefore there is enough room at each of the trees for the male and female giraffe to be feeding without getting in each other's way. Giraffe are social animals and females will often bring their youngsters together into nursery groups for their protection. The large size of giraffe means they're still vulnerable to predation from lions, leopards and hyenas. So a nursery group such as this one with a few adults to watch out for danger is an excellent way of keeping the youngsters safe. We're now going to leave behind Arusha National Park and travel to one of Africa's most famous national parks, which is also in Tanzania. This is the Ngorongoro Crater, the caldera of an extinct volcano that has collapsed within itself. Ngorongoro is about 180 kilometers, 110 miles west of Arusha. The crater floor that you can see in this photograph is around about 100 square miles or 260 square kilometres in area. It's one of Africa's wildlife hotspots and many tourists every year flock to see 
what is in essence an Africa within Africa. The National Park was founded in 1959 and sits within the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, an area of around about 3,000 square miles or 8,000 square kilometres. The name Ngorongoro comes from the Maasai pastoralists, the tribes people of the area, as it describes the sound of their cowbells, the sound of which you heard at the start of this presentation. And since 1959, the Ngorongoro crater has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is considered one of the seven natural wonders of the world. The crater walls dominate all of the views in Ngorongoro. They're around about 610 metres high. These elands are the world's largest antelope and they have been able to make it into the crater to exploit all of the resources there. But the height of the crater walls means not all species have found their way into Ngorongoro. There are no giraffes in the crater, for example. In the middle of the Ngorongoro crater is Lake Magadi, a local word meaning soda, referencing the alkaline waters of the lake itself. The lake and the springs that feed it are key water sources for the animals that live there, including one of the most famous of the East African savanna animals, the wildebeest. Behind the wildebeest, you can see another famous inhabitant of the East African soda lakes, the Lesser Flamingo, which we last saw in Arusha National Park. The Ngorongoro's Lake Magadi is an important feeding ground for Lesser Flamingos, and they stop at the lake as they travel to their important breeding areas in other parts of the Rift Valley. And here in this video, you can see a mixture of plumage colours between adult and juvenile birds, the white, grey and brown individuals are youngsters hatched last year or the following year. The pinker adults are molting into their breeding colours and you can see the birds preening themselves and moving preen oil amongst their feathers to keep their feathers in tip-top condition. And this colour will be used by the flamingos to get everybody ready to perform their courtship display. You can see in this close-up a brighter adult bird next to a duller juvenile. You can also see a range of other water birds that are sharing the lake with the flamingos. Black and white avazets, a wading bird in the background. Ruffs, which are a small browner wading bird behind the avazets. And Cape teal, a beautiful grey duck with green wing patches and a pale pink bill. The Cape teal is a resident across eastern and southern Africa. Whilst these are soda lakes and contain alkaline water, the rainy season in Africa tops up the soda lakes and dilutes their alkalinity. And at certain times of the year, more species are able to utilize them. And some of Africa's national parks are real bird watchers paradise at the right time of the year, attracting many, many species. Like all species of flamingo, the lesser flamingo filter feeds directly from the water column. You can see the birds filter feeding in this video for microscopic algae and other tiny plant materials. It's a similar behaviour to how the ducks are dabbling, but much more refined. And the lesser flamingo must collect huge quantities of these microscopic algae and other plants to turn their feathers that beautiful pink colour. Without the algae, the flamingos won't turn pink and they can't organise their breeding behaviour. And I mentioned that the lakes are not only the haunt of the flamingos, they're also used by other species too. And here we can see some common hippos being perched on by a cattle egret and sacred ibis. The presence of the hippos in Lake Magadi suggests it's not as highly alkaline as some of the other African soda lakes. The hippos would not be able to tolerate the high levels of alkalinity which the flamingos are capable of.
And here's another wading bird that breeds in the short grasses around the lake. It's a crowned plover. Incredibly territorial, it won't fear driving off much larger animals that might come into its territory and trample on its eggs and nest. Wading birds come in all shapes and sizes. Here we've got a member of the stork family, a member of the heron family and a member of the crane family. At the front of the photograph is a saddle-billed stork with its beautiful multicoloured bill. The saddle-billed stork is one of the world's tallest flying birds. They're territorial and pairs are generally found together, sometimes with their youngsters. You can tell the difference between the male and the female saddle-billed stork by the colour of their eyes. This is a female. She has yellow irises. The male's irises are black. At the back of the photograph is an East African grey-crowned crane, an incredibly beautiful species with that unique yellow crown on its head. Sadly, the East African crown cranes are declining in population because of collection for the ornamental bird trade. Natural disease control can also come into play via symbiotic relationships, such as this between the oxpecker and the buffalo. The oxpecker removes all of the ticks, parasites and other biting invertebrates that are living on the buffalo's skin. The oxpecker gets a good meal. The buffalo gets cleaned of all of these parasitic invertebrates, therefore reducing the chances of vector-borne illnesses between the animals. The diverse array of animals supported in Ngorongoro is because of the wide range of habitats, even within a relatively small area. All of the different species of ungulate, for example, like the wildebeest in the background and the eland in the foreground, have different feeding and foraging strategies. The eland is an intermediate feeder. It both grazes and browses, whereas the wildebeest are strictly grazers, so nobody competes. And if we think about the importance of all of these ungulate communities, they drive the population dynamics of the predators that live in the Ngorongoro crater too. And at certain times of the year, when the ungulates breed, that's the time of plenty for the predators. That's when the predators can also go about having their youngsters. There are several prides of lions in the Ngorongoro crater. One of the biggest draws of tourists to be able to see the lions up close in their natural habitat. The lion pride is dominated by the adult females who are all related to each other. Grandmothers, mothers, aunts and nieces and granddaughters all take it in turns to look after and suckle each one another's cubs. And the cubs themselves are protected by the adult females when the males in the pride go out to defend their territory. And it's the females that are responsible for bringing back all of the food that the family relies upon. And here you can see the females of this lion pride have brought back a zebra. The male lions will feed first and then the females with their cubs. There is a strict pecking order within the lion pride as to who feeds first. The male lions must be kept well fed and full of energy because it's an important job that they have in defending their territory. Should other male lions come along and take over that pride, the intruding lions will kill any resident cubs. This is brutal, but it brings the females back into season and into breeding condition, so these new male lions can father their own cubs. Watering holes are excellent places for the lions to gather, to rest up and drink, but also to hunt for their prey. Water within the Serengeti Masai Mara short grass plains ecosystem of East Africa is a scarce commodity. So a lion pride with a permanent water source in it is a really valued territory. And the pride works hard to defend that territory from other intruding animals that might want to take over such a good quality habitat. You can see that this lioness has just filled her belly 
with a delicious meal. She's incredibly stretched around her stomach. And you can also see that she's lactating because of the size of her nipples. Clues that she's not only eating for herself, but she's also eating to produce milk for her cubs as well. And for the cubs of other females in the pride that she too will suckle. And if you listen carefully in the next video that's coming up of the cubs, you will hear their contact calls as well as that of an adult too. Lion cubs are born with spots. This is excellent camouflage should danger strike. Danger not just in the form of marauding males looking to take over their pride, but also from animals like Cape Buffalo, whose herds have been known to seek out and actively kill lion cubs, the lion being one of the buffalo's main predators. The spots lighten and eventually disappear with age. When the lions have finished with their kill, it's the chance for scavengers to come along to clear up the remains. This is a golden jackal, one of the most widespread of all canids, being found across Asia, Europe, as well as Africa. The golden jackal is more closely related to the wolf and coyote than it is to the other African species of jackal. And he is one of the largest species of scavengers although it's also perfectly capable of hunting for itself. This is the spotted hyena, the most social of all of the carnivora. Unlike the lion, female hyenas do not provide for each other's youngsters. They focus solely on their own offspring. Hyenas are formidable enemies of lions, and lions are formidable enemies of hyenas, and clashes between the boundaries of the lion and hyena territories are common. Predator inspection behaviours by many ungulate species and other types of animal too are common. Here's a Thompson's gazelle closely watching a black-backed jackal. This predator inspection will keep the predator out of range of the prey. The prey knows what's going on and the predator is less likely to hunt something that's watching it. Black-backed jackals are ferocious predators of young and sub-adult Thompson's gazelle so it pays for this mother to be attentive. Predators have an important role in controlling the populations of herbivorous animals, particularly somewhere like Ngorongoro, with a restricted access in and out of the crater. A certain number of lions, hyenas, jackals and so forth are required to weed out the weak, ill or sick animals from the large herds of game animals. This keeps the predator numbers healthy by ensuring there is a sustainable population of animals. And it also keeps the prey species sustainable too. The prey don't outstrip the natural herbivorous resources that they depend upon. So this is a fine balance between the needs of predators and prey. And this relationship between the carnivores and the herbivores is defined as an arms race. Scavengers are also essential to the health of the ecosystem. Populations of white-backed and griffin vultures clear away the carcasses after the lions and hyenas. They remove decomposing bodies and the associated pathogens from the environment. The population crash 
decline in vulture numbers is a really important thing that must be rectified because without the vultures, the health of the ecosystem and the fact that we can maintain so many disease free populations of animals will suffer. And in the case of this hippo, the ibises and egrets remove leeches and other parasites, thus providing a cleaning service which keeps the hippo healthy. So all of these populations of animals, of all of the species, the interactions between them are essential to the functioning of the ecosystem. And some species, like these Cape buffalo, can actually create new niches within the habitat by moving vegetation, creating wallows, driving different features before them as their herds move across the landscape. And that creates new feeding and foraging areas for birds like this resident abdim stork or this migratory white stork that's come from Europe. Both the white stork and the abdim stork will benefit from the buffalo's landscaping activities. The herds of buffalo that drive insects, for example, before them will be snapped up by the storks a tasty treat for the migratory birds to get their energy reserves back and useful food for the resident abdim stork that they can use to feed their youngsters. And the actions of the buffalo also benefit one of Africa's most unusual birds, the secretary bird. The buffalo moving through the vegetation displace many reptiles and amphibians, which are the favourite foods of the secretary bird and it uses its unique foot stamping behaviour to dispatch and kill its prey. Cropping the grasses, the grazing ungulates create habitat for smaller species like this African savannah hare, a nocturnal lagomorph that you're likely to see on your overnight game drive. The African savannah hare eats predominantly grasses and herbs, so benefits from the lawn mowing behaviours of the ungulates. But the hare has to be careful because keeping watch on the movements of the herds are predators such as this auger buzzard and the auger buzzard will look for any displaced mammals like the hare that are moving out of the way of the herds. So by keeping an eye on the behaviour of the grazing ungulates that makes the foraging strategy of the buzzard much more effective. The top landscaper in Ngorongoro is the elephant. Only bull elephants are found in the Ngorongoro crater because it's only the bull elephants that are able to make the climb up the crater walls and into the volcanic caldera. Elephants manage the woodland by pushing down and eating trees. They dig holes with their tusks and trunks which creates new water sources and they fertilize the ground wherever they go. The elephant also provides foraging opportunities for the egrets in a similar way that we saw the ibis and egrets eating the parasites from the skin of the hippo. And the elephant also provides a useful vantage point for these birds to scan the environment to find new food patches. So one single bull elephant can convey a whole range of important ecological processes. I hope you have enjoyed this virtual safari to two of Tanzania's most diverse national parks. Very different in nature, the smaller, potentially more urban setting of Arusha National Park, the larger, wilder Ngorongoro crater. But for both locations, the relationships that exist between all of the species that live there, both plant and animal, are essential to the future health and well-being of all of the animals and of all of the plants and of the human inhabitants of the area too. And finally, a big shout out to my very dear friend, Mr Guido Kautz, for providing all of these wonderful photos and video footage for me to be able to make this presentation. Thank you very much.